Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's lovely to have you back here again. We've had a, a couple of weeks off, but um, you're in for a real treat this evening. Um, those of you that have joined us previously, you'll know about the Q&A facility and the chat facility. So um, if you have any questions, if you'd like to click on the Q&A button and pop your questions in there, and we'll ask Rachel um, at the end, probably. And um, it would be lovely to know who's here this evening. So if you click on the chat and say hi, you're all very, very welcome. Um, so tell me who, who you are. And I know some of my Benham colleagues are here this evening. And we've got Lise from Denmark. Hello. And I'm sure you're not the only one there. There must be more of you. I'm just waiting for a few other people to come in. Sandra, hi, Sandra and Pete from Vista. You've been with us before. <laughs> Debbie from the New Forest, you're very welcome. You love these events. We love you being being with us. Mandy from Kidlington, just down the road. Jenny from London, hi. And it's Rachel's sister, Becky, in Torquay. <laughs> well, you're very, very welcome, Becky. Are you in the same house or are you just down the way? And my favourite colleague, Charlie, hi. His words, not mine, I have to say, but of course, you're absolutely right. Lovely. Uh, Rosemary, lovely to see you or hear you. Sue, and we'll just wait a few more minutes, or another minute, and then we'll get started. But it's so lovely that you're all here. Okay, so it gives me enormous pleasure this evening um, to welcome Rachel Trithui, and I, I've been practicing this. Um, it hasn't gone very well, but there we are. I'm just going to call you Rachel from now on. And Rachel is the author of this amazing book, Churchill Girls. And, you know, you're all familiar with Winston Churchill. You know, we've heard so much about his politics, about various other things, but it's just so wonderful to learn about his girls. And my goodness, they were characters, weren't they, Rachel? They certainly were. <laughs> Never a dull moment with them. <laughs> and Rachel, I, I mean, as I say, it's, it's really quite something to, to gather this information together and to produce this, this amazing book. What inspired you? What made you think to yourself, right, I need to get up today and start writing this, this story of their lives? Well, I first came across them by chance. I was researching another project in the Churchill Archives at Cambridge. Um, my publishers were interested in a, book, in a book on Churchill's animals. And I found this letter um, from Winston's second daughter, Sarah, to Winston, which was so intimate and informal. It made me want to find out more about her relationship with her father and what she was like. Because, first of all, she wrote beautifully, but also she was so relaxed with her father. So I saw him in a new light, not as this great war leader and bulldog, but as a really caring parent. Right. And at what stage? What, tell me a bit more about the letter. What, what was it? What, what really the letter gripped your imagination? covers all the themes that we do in the book. She was a very troubled person who had a lot of conflicts, inner conflicts in her life. And she wrote this letter from Rome in March 1947. And she was out there just after um, the war, restarting her career. Um, she was there filming her first film. She'd been an actress and dancer before the war, but she gave that up to support her father and mother and also to serve in the forces. Uh, so this was a really important time for her. And it was also just a couple of months before her younger sister, um, after her younger sister Mary had got married. So she was thinking about where she was in her life and she wanted to explore this with her father. And if you don't mind, I'll read you a few quotes from yeah, no, right really well. Um, she said she wanted to explain to him about how she was really driven to act, a bit like he was driven to be in politics. And she said, does all this seem unimportant to you or just strange that I should care so much and feel 
Still, as I have always felt that my mortal happiness, if it exists, is wound up somewhere in this business. And she then also explores her feelings about marriage and children. She didn't really feel having a family was compatible with her life as an actress. And she said, the security of life or the fulfillment of a natural marriage and children that certainly I could have chosen and had, and which you so naturally and rightfully wanted for me, seemed never to have drawn me. And she knew that Winston was a very traditional man who believed that women should bring up children and um, get married and support their husbands. And she goes on to say to him, I know what you feel women should be. And of course it is right. How else would the world go on if women did not and had not played their part as women? But I suppose every now and then something goes wrong and a mule is born. Now this mule is the nickname she was given in the family. Um, which was because they said she was obstinate and she did not breed. And she, she took it in good stead. You know, she, it was a humorous thing. It was a family yeah. joke. And in the end, she'd sign off her letters as the mule and even do these lovely little sketches of a mule in various positions and things. And this light motif is really charming. It runs throughout their letters for decades. Right. Gosh. So you, you, again, not, not to skip over it. So she was an actress. Um, she, which is pretty must have been quite unusual in their family to have it, someone it was it wasn't seen as quite the career for someone who was a debutante who was from an aristocratic family um, but she knew that it was the one thing she really wanted to do so as soon as she'd left finishing school she joined um, a dancing school and then she became one of uh, Mr Cochrane's young ladies and appeared you know, all over the country, sort of dancing across the stage in frilly knickers and um, <laughs> short dresses. And she just loved it. She was a very classless person and she enjoyed the whole atmosphere of being with people who weren't stuffy. She didn't enjoy being a debutante. Um, she wanted a much more sort of bohemian life, really, certainly than her sisters went for. Uh -huh. And by, um, so the letter was in, dated 1947. So what sort of age was she by then? And um, I was just having a look. So she was born in 1914? Yes, she was sort of about 32. And she actually writes about this being a turning point. There's a quote from her which says, Dying Papa, do you understand at all? I must resolve this thing inside me once and for all. One can flounder around it at 18 for a course to pursue. But at 32, the course should be set. And I think at this point, she feels she hasn't achieved what she ought to do. Um, she had been married. She married this older comedian, Vic Oliver, and her parents were very against it. She eloped to America um, to be with him. And eventually her parents came round to the fact they'd married, but it didn't work out and they divorced during the war. And she hadn't had children. Her elder sister, Diana, had married and had three children. Mary had just got married and was to go on to have five children. Um, and she also had put her career on hold to support her father. And so at 32, she's thinking, what's my future going to be like? And it was something she really wanted her father to understand. And she wrote to him, this letter is so hard for me to write. Prizing open oy an oyster is hard work but distance somehow brings one closer than living in the next street. And I've tried to open my heart to you so that perhaps you can understand. And I think always for Sarah, although she had a lot of different men in her life, the one who mattered most to her was Winston. And she wanted him to really be proud of her and get why she was acting as she did. It's extraordinary, really, because, you know, in, in some way or in many ways, you think that she was born into such an extraordinary family, um, but probably a family that have the same issues as as all of us, you know, and, and certainly the concept of a child wanting its parents approval is, isn't unusual, is it really? No matter how old. I yeah. think all the daughters really wanted um, their father and their mother's approval. They really looked up to both of them, um, both Clementine and Winston, were incredible characters. I mean, Clementine was an exceptional woman, as well as Winston, obviously, being an incredible man. And 
all the time. They're seeking their approval. And I think the girls really um, got the approval most for what they were doing in the war when they supported Winston yeah. in 17. And Rachel, if I may, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you because we'll come on and we're going to look at that um, shortly. But I just want to take you back again. So you found this letter while you were looking for information about his pets. Yeah. Um, and then what happened? Did, did, was it something that you acted upon immediately? Um, you know, what happened next? No, um, I find this happens that you have an idea and you think I'm going to write about that one day. And if you find a letter like this um, that really sticks with you, and this one did, I just had it in my mind. Um, although I was working on other projects, I was doing a book on Edward VIII and his women before Wallace. Um, but I thought, no, there's a really good idea there. Um, and so once I'd finished doing Before Wallace, I thought, right, I can really get down to research now. And I was just bowled over by what I found because all four of Winston's daughters were well worth writing about. Mm -hmm. And there was, of course, Diana, who was the eldest born in 1909, Sarah, born in 1914, and then Marigold, born in 1918. Mm -hmm. And tragically, Marigold didn't live to fulfill her potential. She died of septicemia when she was only three years old. And then there was Mary, who was born after Marigold had died in 1922. And reading about them, I just thought there is such an amazing story here that I, I hadn't really known. Um, and I thought a lot of other people won't know it either. And it was one that I felt should be told. Well, you mentioned um, some of the other girls and this is a, a page from your, your book. Um, and can you can you tell us who, who we can see here? Yes. So, You've got Diana at the top with um, Clementine and Diana was born in 1909. She was their first child um, and she was a shy, sensitive little girl. Then you've got um, at the bottom, you've got um, Sarah, who was known as the Bumblebee. And you can really see why in that. They all had nicknames. Um, the, and then you've got little Marigold, the one who died, who was known as the Duckadilly. And... <laughs> I think it's a really interesting picture, um, each of the ones with Clementine with her babies, because she isn't holding them in the way I think, you know, you and I as mothers would hold a child. Mm -hmm. She wasn't a very maternal woman. And you can see there that, you know, she isn't someone who bonds easily with babies or small children. She looks awkward, doesn't she? Yes, I think yeah. she didn't have a very good model of parenting from her mother and she found it um, very difficult being a mother. She went away a lot of the time and left the care of her children to other people, um, which seems strange to modern ears, but that was fairly typical of her generation. Um, women usually um, of her class would hand the children over to nannies um, and then send them to either boarding schools or have governesses. And Clementine, like many women of her era, certainly put her husband first, way above her children. Which, which again, um, I suppose, is a little bit of history repeating itself. Certainly, Winston's parents were the same, and and Denny would, you know, there's again been so much written about whether he was neglected as a child, etc. But he was looked after by his nanny. He was sent to boarding school. His mother supported his father when his father died. She supported Winston. So you're absolutely right. It's it's how things were. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was, um, although I think probably Clementine was away more than most. I mean, she would be literally away for months um, on end. I mean, I came to the conclusion that it wasn't just because she you know, wanted a frivolous life and to be away. I think that she actually needed it for her own mental health and balance because Winston was such a massive ego that um, it would be easy to be sort of swallowed up in his narcissism. Um, and so maybe that's too strong a word, the narcissism, but the ego was so strong yeah. that she needed that time away um, to sort of bolster herself up. And I think also she did suffer anxiety about her children because I read things that said, you know, when she was there, she'd worry about them running around and hitting themselves and hurting themselves on things. And I think, again, that came from her childhood um, because she was very, very close to her elder sister, uh, Kitty, and she died of, at 17 of um, typhoid fever. And I think this fear of losing something you loved made her very anxious, probably, with her children, and getting away was one of the ways she could switch off. 
And so how, how you know, again, the, the death of a child doesn't bear thinking about. How do you think Marigold's death, you know, how did it affect her and Winston? How, how did they deal with it? Marigold's death was absolutely awful. She was a lovely little girl, seen as very radiant and full of fun and, you know, sort of would run around the table laughing when they had guests and loved singing I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. She was quite a charismatic little girl and Winston would take her with him to, even to places like Chequers when he was visiting Lloyd George. Um, but the trouble at this point was that Clementine and Winston wanted to lead their own lives. Winston with his career, Clementine going off all over the place, and they didn't get very good staff to look after them. And so Clementine was away and Winston was in London and they had an inexperienced sort of nursery, nurse stroke governess, mm -hmm. uh, was in charge of the children. And they went to Broadstairs in Kent and little Marigold um, was playing on the beach one day. <clears throat> and then shortly afterwards, she developed a cold, which became a sore throat, which became septicemia. And in the, day, in the days before antibiotics, there was nothing that could be done to save her. Her parents got there just in time before she died. And <clears throat> it's a really tragic scene. Winston wrote about it and said that Clementine gave a shriek like a wounded animal. And I think she couldn't really express her feelings afterwards. Um, it was such a horrendous thing um, that, you know, they tried to carry on. They went up to Scotland on holiday afterwards. Winston stayed up there painting at Dunrobin Castle. Clementine brought the other children back. But it wasn't really talked about. Um, her younger, youngest daughter, Mary, didn't even know about what had happened to Marigold, the child before her, um, until much later on. Um, and so Clementine bottled all this up and you know, carried on with a sort of stiff upper lip, and maybe it was just too awful to face. Gosh, it, it doesn't bear thinking about. It, it, Rachel, you and I, uh, oh sorry, you you recently uh, did a talk and I, I uh, listened to it, and um, something came up that I think surprised both of us about Marigold and where she was, she was buried. Yes, I mean, she was buried uh, very quickly, you know, it, I think they were just stunned uh, mm -hmm and Clementine and she was buried in Kensal Green Cemetery and that's not where the rest of Churchill family um, are buried and I found out I was doing um, a session with Emma Soames and Emma said that actually um, the children now the surviving children of Mary um, and Diana decided that Marigold should be removed from Kensal Green and actually buried at Bladen with the rest of Churchill family and I think that's rather touching, you know, mm. sort of reuniting her at last and giving her the place in the family that she deserved, because it was a real turning point in the Churchill's family life. I think after that, they realised um, that until then, the family had had a rather nomadic existence, um, leasing houses and never being in one place um, for long and not getting good enough staff to look after children if their parents were going off to lead their own lives. But after what happened with Marigold, things changed. And it was in 1922 that Winston found Chartwell and um, they got proper um, a proper governess for the children. Gosh, it's amazing that it takes something like that. And um, we've only got a few slides this evening, but um, I'm just going to go to the next one, if I may, um, if I can, <laughs> there we go. Um, and this one, I like. Um, and can you can you tell us who the two children are? Um, yep. yep. So you've got um, Sarah there and Diana, and they it just shows this picture how involved the whole family was in Winston's political life. It was a project for everyone. When Clementine married Winston, she knew that her life would be dedicated to getting him to the top. He believed he had a destiny and that he would one day um, be prime minister, and she believed it too. But the children were brought up to believe that as well. Um, and you can see this on budget day that they would go with him when he was walking to the House of Commons. He really, you know, always had his children around him. It gave him a sort of sense of security, I think. Partly, as you say, he didn't have a very secure childhood himself. Um, so he really valued family life. And 
I love that picture actually of Sarah right at the front because she looks like a little mule there, doesn't she? She looks really quite stubborn, <laughs> quite, quite um, like a young boy and just really sort of set look on her face. Um, but actually Diana, the eldest child, was probably more political than um, Sarah was. She really enjoyed going around with her father to meetings when her mother couldn't go. And before she was married, she even did a few speeches herself at political events. And she really loved political ideas. Diana wasn't um, particularly bright at school. She did very badly in exams, but she managed to be able to write really well on things like tariff reform, which was <laughs> complex. <laughs> so it's really interesting to see that they obviously just took in politics with their mother's milk and mm -hmm. hearing their father speak all the time around the dinner table um, about politics. And is that Randolph on the end, um, on the right? It looks like him. I think it is. Um, I'm just seeing if he it would be the right age. He would be 18 then. Yeah. Um, I would think it probably is him. Which, which leads me to a very, very um, kind of smoothly to another question. So you chose to write about the girls um, and, and or not ignored Randolph, but he's not star of the of the the story and why why is that well i very purposely focused on the daughters because they haven't been written about um as a one entity before and they've always been overpowered by everyone else in their family i felt um randolph is this really flamboyant character um but he you know was the sort of heir apparent to winston winston wanted to found a political dynasty and he believed he could do that with randolph it was boys not girls who he believed um could do really do things in the world um but it I didn't want Randolph overpowering the story, so I purposely didn't deal with him in depth. And actually, um, not that I'm going to plug it too much, but a biography is out of Randolph at the moment, which is a lovely companion book to mine, because I thought you've got to take these larger than life other characters out to really see the girls in their true perspective. So although obviously I focus on the family dynamics and talk about Winston and Clementine, I really wanted to see what the three um, surviving daughters were like. And mm -hmm. I felt that was particularly important for their eldest daughter, Diana, because she was the most self-effacing, sensitive and shy of the family. And so very little is known about her at all. And I actually grew to be very fond of her writing about her because she had the least ego, but was probably the most compassionate of all um, the family. She was the person who was always there for everyone else. If something went wrong in your life, Diana be there quietly by your side, not wanting the limelight, but being supportive. And actually I was pleased to um, be able to find more on her than I expected to. There aren't as many letters um, from her in the archives, but there are enough for me to get a really good picture of her. And she was a very troubled soul, but she was a very sensitive, compassionate person. And, and th this, this, photograph is of her on her wedding day um, but it this wasn't her first marriage um, no. um Diana found it hard to find a vocation I mean it was hard for women in that era anyway to have proper careers and particularly for girls of her class she came out as a debutante and unfortunately for her she came out at the same time as Diana Mitford who happened to be her cousin and of course there were comparisons between the two Dianas. And although Diana Churchill was very pretty, Diana Mitford was one of the great beauties of her generation and was Deb of the year. And um, Diana Mitford married at the end of her season, whereas Diana Churchill felt a bit of a failure because she didn't snare herself a husband. Um, but it was interesting because both Diana and her sisters were just not social butterflies. They weren't really interested in that whole thing. They had a greater sense of duty and wanted to do something with um, real meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and so she sort of floundered around trying a few careers. She tried being an actress for a bit, but that didn't work out for long. She did a bit of um, nursing and then there was a chance she might get into movies. Nothing came together. She then got married um, in 1932 to her first husband who was the son of um, a diamond magnet, um, who was a friend of Winston's, Abe Bailey. But that was a disaster. Her first husband um, was an alcoholic. 
uh, marriage only lasted a couple of years. And of course, this left Diana feeling a real failure because there were very few divorces in those days. Mm. Um, and, you know, to have a divorce, have no career, um, it was a big embarrassment to her. Was, was the lack of career uh, as important? Because, again, it was a different time. And, and, you know, rightly or wrongly, I never think of that as being a period when women would typically have careers. No, I don't think that's something that Diana or Mary particularly wanted, her younger sister Mary. Yeah. Diana and Mary were very traditional women. And I think that really what Diana wanted out of life just was a nice marriage, perhaps to be like her mother, looking at um, who she chose as her second husband, mm -hmm. the conservative politician Duncan Sands. Um, she met him when her brother Randolph fought him in a by-election. Um, it was um, Duncan Sands won and he met Diana and they married and it seemed to be everything she wanted in a second marriage. Um, and they had three children together. And I think that was would have been enough for Diana. Um, she wasn't ambitious in the same way that Sarah was. Mm -hmm. Sarah was unusual for her generation and ahead of her time. Both Diana and Mary were very much more typical women of their era. And although they did things during the war, both would um, be perfectly happy to revert to traditional stereotypical female roles. Right, and, and what happened to Diana in the end? Because she worked for the Samaritans. She yeah. said she was the pairing one and, and supported people. She was very caring. She understood what people went through. She had always had um, mental health problems. Um, she had low self-esteem, I think it would be described uh, when she was young. And she was really overpowered in such a sort of flamboyant family. She found it pretty excruciating, the dinners where everyone was really noisy and talked. Mm. And she couldn't really compete. Um, and so she wanted to withdraw from that, get married, move on. Um, then in the 1950s, uh, she suffered a severe mental breakdown and was hospitalized and given electroconvulsive therapy and insulin coma therapy. And of course, the treatments for mental health problems were not good at that time. You know, it, it was um, there weren't the antidepressants and things that would help now. And her marriage was also breaking down. I mean, talking to the family, they say you can't be sure whether the mental health problems made her marriage more difficult or whether her marriage breaking down her husband having affairs made her mental health worse. But um, she was a naturally monogamous person and she never really got over the breakdown of her marriage to Duncan Sands. Um, he went on to marry someone else and I think that was pretty heartbreaking for mm -hmm. her. And then in the last couple of years of her life, she did seem to have finally found a vocation because she was involved in the early days of the Samaritans and worked there and got a tremendous reputation there being a really kind person. And she didn't want to be known as her father's daughter there. Mm -hmm. She used the name Mrs. Spencer, um, but people wrote about how kind she was in that situation. And everyone thought her life was coming back together more, that she um, had found a real role for herself. And then very tragically in October, 1963, she committed suicide um, and, you know, it was just a terrible tragedy, like Marigold's tragedy, the second mm -hmm. of losing two children for Winston and Clementine. Yeah, and, and a, a much later stage in their lives as well. I mean, goodness me. And, and, and again, I, I find it fascinating because, it, you know, we, we are familiar with the fact that Winston had his black dog, but you know, clearly he wasn't the only one in the family by any means. No, I mean, it is interesting um, to see that it is on both sides. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is wide debate among historians and biographers about the extent of Winston's black dog and Mary Soames, his daughter, and um, certainly his latest biographer, Andrew Roberts, actually think it uh, that Winston's black dog wasn't as bad as some people have said. I mean, he has been described as a manic depressive, but they actually um, believe that he became depressed um, according to circumstances. When things were bad, for instance, after Gallipoli, when he thought his career was over, he became depressed. When things didn't go well, uh, when he was in the wilderness, the political mm -hmm. wilderness, he might be depressed. And when he was worried, what would happen with the Nazis? And then at certain times in the war, and in later life, um, as he you know, lost his lost power and lost physical health as well, yeah. um, he seemed depressed. 
but they said it wasn't something um, really as entrenched as has been said by some people. What I found interesting was that Clementine um, certainly suffered from extreme anxiety, and that's shown by her latest biographer, Sonia Purnell. And I think that explains how she reacted in a lot of situations. Uh, and talking to her um, secretary, her private secretary in the 1960s, Sheila Montague Brown, she said that she was an incredibly neurotic person. That's the word she used. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, at times she was hospitalized um, with mental health problems, as well as Diana being. Um, so Diana and um, uh, Clementine had mental health problems and Sarah and Randolph were alcoholics. So they were they had a lot of issues to contend with. And when that you, is a lot. You know, when you think all of this going on behind the scenes, and then, you, you know, we all know Winston's public life, and there was so much to contend with in the private life, too. My goodness. OK, we're, we're going to, um, if I may, just go back and we, we, we're going to perhaps come back to Diana, but move on to Sarah again. There we are. Um, and this again is a, a page taken from your book. So can you can you explain to us who she's with, what's going on, yes. and why you included these photos? Well, I think these photos just capture Sarah's glamour. And she really was nearly a great beauty, nearly a great actress, but there was something in her that meant she never quite made it. She could sort of soar or flop. I mean, her mother, Clementine, said. She could look like this great beauty, but she could equally look like this mopey raven, is the words Clementine used. Clementine had quite a sharp tongue. Um, but that photo shows how she was a cover girl, not only in this country, but later on in America. And the lower photograph shows her with her first husband, the comedian Vic Oliver. And she met him when she was in um, Mr. Cochrane's Young Ladies dancing across um, the stage in her frilly knickers. He was the star of the show and a very charismatic comedian. Um, and he was of Austrian Jewish descent. Um, and she totally fell for him. He was her first great love. But Winston and Clementine didn't approve. And Winston said, um, leave it a year. And if you still want to marry each other, then I'll think about it again. Well, Sarah was desperately lonely without him and decided that she'd elope with him to America. He was in America. She decided. Um, that she'd sail across the Atlantic on a liner to join him. So she did it, um, snuck out without telling her family what she was doing. She told her mother she was going to the hairdressers in London. Um, and they only heard through the newspapers what had happened. Um, and Mary also had to tell them because she'd confided in Mary, her younger sister, what she was going to do. And um, Sarah started sailing across the Atlantic Randolph, her brother, was sent to pursue her on another liner. And the, Sarah arrived in New York, was met by Vic, and Churchill did everything he could to break up the marriage. Um, he got a private detective onto Vic to see if he could find any real dirt. He couldn't. Um, and Sarah married him. And they came back to England, and the Churchills had to accept it. Um, but it wasn't the marriage Sarah hoped it would be. Sarah was always looking for someone to advance her career. She really cared about her career. And Vic had promised to make her a star. But the trouble was, actually, Vic wanted to be the only star. So once Sarah started um, being um, doing well in her career, he didn't like it. And um, he really was a very controlling man. And I think she had a real need to get out of that marriage. Uh, because he didn't want her to do well. He resented it uh, as her career advanced. And, you know, he did some incredible things. He found another um, young girl who he took under his wing. Um, he probably didn't have an affair with her, but he said, would they, could they adopt her? And this was just such an awful thing to say to Sarah, who didn't have children with him. Um, I think there was a, quite a lot of mental cruelty and she was, Sarah was still very young. I mean, she was in her uh, late 20s. Yeah, exactly. Very young. And he was much, much older, either some accounts say 16 years, other 18. But she did have a tendency always to marry the wrong men. There was a very big self-destructive streak mm -hmm. in her. You know, I, and again, this 
this is absolute trivia, but I was always amazed. I used to used to go along to a local quiz and I always wanted them to ask the question, who was the first guest on Desert Island Discs? Of course, it was Dick Oliver. Yes. I mean, he, How bizarre. he was massively famous, though. Yeah. They were a real power couple. He was famous in the war. He was in um, the most popular radio show at the beginning of the war, High Gang. Um, so he now probably very few people know who he was. But at the time, they were a really glamorous yeah. couple. It's, it's extraordinary, isn't it, when you when you put it into that sort of context. Now, we're, we're going to kind of move on to, to you, you mentioned earlier that Sarah gave up her career um, to look after her father. And again, if, if you could talk us, tell us what's going on in this photograph, which is rather stupendous, I think. Yes, this is an amazing photo. Um, Winston didn't have very good health in the war and Clementine didn't want to always travel with him, but it was felt that because it was thought he'd had a heart attack when he was in Washington in 1941, he should always have a member of the family as well as his doctor with him. Um, and so Sarah and Mary would go either one or the other of them with, with him to many of the important conferences in the war. And this one is Sarah at Tehran in 1943. And as you can see, it was the most incredible experience. She's the only woman there. She is with the most important men in the world. She is a uh, um, with Roosevelt and Stalin. And it was just what an incredible experience to be an eyewitness at the most historic events. However, it was also a tremendous responsibility because if something happened to Winston, not only would they lose their father, they, the country, the world needed him there, needed him to survive, to win the war. And at times he became really ill. He developed um, pneumonia after this conference and Sarah had to look after him until Clementine came out to help. Um, it, it was a sort of double-edged sword with them, an incredible privilege, but also a worry. Um, but the girls absolutely loved it. Um, they not only really enjoyed meeting all these top politicians, they wrote about it in wonderful detail. And you get their accounts of what they thought of people like Stalin, who at that time was being incredibly charming. Um, and he charmed Sarah at Winston's 69th birthday, um, drinking toast to her, coming around, clinking glasses with her. Um, they all absolutely adored Roosevelt, of course. And again, he was very, very charming to both Sarah and Mary when he met them. I think obviously they were very attractive young girls, but also they knew he, he knew how important Winston's daughters were to him. And it was another way of cementing all the bonds. Do you think at this stage where, because wasn't Winston very proud of Sarah and, and the job she was doing? Um, and didn't he let slip some, some secrets that, that he shouldn't have done? Well, <laughs> He, it's very interesting because she was working um, at RAF Medellin doing um, in photographic interpretation work, which meant that they'd look at um, aerial photographs and see what would be bombed or where things would happen. Um, but it, she was taught it's absolutely top secret. And um, she went round um, before the invasion of North Africa to, um, to Chequers, which was very close to RAF Medellin one day. And um, she rushed upstairs to see her father who just got out of his bath and was wrapped in a great big towel. And he mentioned um, something about, let slip as you say, something about the North African invasion, Operation Torch. And um, she said, no, you're not quite right on that. And he went, how do you know? And she said, well, I've been looking at it. And he was amazed um, and just said, well, you didn't tell me about that. And she said, there is such a thing as secrecy, you know. <laughs> And he then, uh, apparently the story went on because he told Eleanor Roosevelt this story and she used it in speeches about women's war work. And um, Sarah got into trouble back at the RAF base um, for letting out secrets. And she said, well, I only said it to my father. So um, that was a really, really lovely story about their relationship. Do, do you think um, because of what the girls did and what Clementine did to support him, would that have changed his view at all of a woman's place? I think it certainly did, because all his daughters served in the war. Mm -hmm. uh, they have this tremendous sense of duty. As I mentioned earlier, they didn't just want to be society girls and social butterflies. 
they believed your life had to be used for public service. Um, and so when the war happened, um, Diana was more limited because she had three small children, but she worked in um, the welfare office of the Wrens for a bit and was a fire watcher and volunteered in a hospital, did things like that. But both Sarah and Mary had really impressive war careers. Um, Sarah, uh, as I mentioned, was in the RAF at Medmenham um, doing some top secret work. Um, but Mary had a really stellar war career. She was a gunner girl and um, she rose up the ranks, um, was very well respected by the girls she became in charge of. And she went to Germany at the end of the war and um, was at Belsen when um, went to visit the hospital at Belsen shortly after it had been opened up. And they really, really did well, not only supporting their father and mother, but in their own um, service careers. Mm -hmm. And Winston was immensely proud. In fact, he wrote to Randolph saying, you know, you should be really proud of what your sisters are doing. They've taken a very difficult route um, and they're doing exceptionally well. And I think it did change his attitude to what women were capable of. Um, he was very much of his era, a Victorian, um, who believed that really women were meant to be um, the supports of men and um, be at home. But his views began to change, I think, through their wartime career. Um, and I think he also then listened to them more on politics. For instance, in 1945, in the general election, um, Sarah toured with him and wrote to him about what um, her colleagues in the forces were feeling. And she said to him, you know, you really need to do something um, to match what Labour's offering with the beverage report. Um, and she said, you really ought to tackle housing in the same way that you tackled the war. You must make all out war on that. And it influenced him so much that that appeared in a Conservative Party broadcast shortly before the election and he raised it in Cabinet. And Clementine wrote to Sarah saying, you know, you, um, you really are very shrewd politically. Um, so I think his attitude did change. Um, just looking at that photo there, again, I think that's a really lovely photo. Again, that shows um, Sarah with Winston. And then you've got Roosevelt there with his daughter, Anna Botiga. And it's a really poignant photo um, because it's one of the last of Roosevelt before he died. And on this trip, Sarah, in her letters um, to her mother, was very aware that Roosevelt was failing, that he was very ill. And his daughter was there to support him, like Sarah was there to support Winston. And so you've got the most powerful men in the world sitting there, but they also look like two old men, don't they, with their daughters? I mean, it's, it's an incredible photo. Yeah, it's superb. And then just so after the war, um, Sarah was able to return to her her career? She was. She went to America and she was actually much more famous in America um, than she ever was in Britain. And this was one of the highlights of her career. She'd always admired Fred Astaire as the great dancer. Um, and so um, she appeared in a film with him, Royal Wedding, in 1951. It wasn't a very big role, but she got to dance with him and I think she got him in the end. And in America, she was very involved in the early days of television and she hosted some shows. Uh, she also acted. And I love this fact that um, she appeared in the first televised version of Hamlet in America. She was Ophelia. And <laughs> I read that more people saw this version of Hamlet than would have seen Hamlet in the 350 years since it was first written because television was really taking off in America. That's quite something, isn't it? <laughs> And then we're, we're going to finish up with Sarah now. Um, and again, if, tell us what happened. Yes. That. Here you see her second husband, Anthony Beecham, at the top. And again, he's a very good looking, charismatic man. He was a society photographer. He photographed the most beautiful women in the world, Vivian Lee, um, Audrey Hepburn, Marilyn Monroe. He was very, very talented, but they had a very passionate and stormy relationship. And um, I mean, his, his mother said they couldn't really live together, but they couldn't live apart. Um, Winston and Clementine, again, didn't really approve of him, um, but she married him anyway. And that caused a brief family rupture, particularly with Clementine. Um, but Anthony tragically committed suicide. And 
Sarah was devastated. They weren't actually living together then. They were about to get divorced. They'd been separated for some time. He was having other relationships and she was seeing some other people. So it wasn't, they were completely together, but they'd never really totally stopped loving each other. And after that, I think she turned to alcohol to deaden the pain. I think she'd probably been drinking before that. There was always that problem there, um, but it got much worse. And rather than stay around people who loved and knew her in this country, she went back to America and she was in Malibu and in a beach house there. And um, she obviously had drunk too much one night and a phone operator heard her on the phone swearing, they said, like someone in the Navy. And the police were sent round and she came outside and they arrested her. And there's a photo of that below. And the awful thing for Sarah was, you know, if that had happened to an ordinary person, it would have nothing much would have happened. Um, but because it was her, the police tipped off the press and those right. sort of photos, which were quite degrading, appeared on newspapers across the world, which was really devastating for her and for her parents, who were quite elderly by this time. Gosh, they, they I mean, you know, we've said it before you would think that they had everything and yet you know it, so much sadness so much tragedy um so we're going to move on and because i'm aware that we we've only looked at um oh sorry we've only looked at uh, sarah and diana in any great depth um and this is a photograph that, that you particularly liked i love this photo this is the youngest daughter Mary with Winston um, during the war on HMS Duke of York and I think that's great they look really alike don't they from behind yeah. uh, I think she looked the most like Winston Mary unlike her sisters had an absolutely happy life you'll be glad to hear everyone um, she had a very different childhood she was brought up at um, Chartwell with a very stable governess um, Moppet or Nana she was called the governess um, and so even when her mother went away for months on holiday. Mary always felt very secure. She also had a naturally happy temperament and that stayed with her throughout her life. When I was writing this, my publisher said to me, do you think, you know, could she really have been that happy as anyone? And by everything I've read and by anyone I spoke to, she really was. She had a great temperament and a really positive life. Um, and so, she um, had this lovely upbringing at Chartwell with loads of animals, a whole menagerie of animals. She built walls with Churchill, um, time with him. From a teenage year, she got on really well with her mother. Her mother totally depended on her and they'd go off skiing together and had a very strong relationship. And then during the war, she had a very impressive career um, with as a gunner girl. But after the war, she knew that she wanted to just um, marry and have children and so she married the conservative politician Christopher Soames and they had five children together and it was an incredibly happy marriage and when they first got together Christopher had said to her whatever we achieve we'll achieve together it won't be my career it will be your career and so he became a cabinet minister and um, he then later became um, the ambassador to France she went with him and he was the last governor of Rhodesia and right the way through she supported him but um, Mary I think is the person who really had it all because she had this incredibly happy family life but then later in life she also had um, a successful late flourishing career she became a very good writer writing the biography of her mother and also about the Churchill family generally um, you were saying as well the Duke of Marlborough yeah the fifth, fifth Duke of Marlborough the profligate Duke excellent book Mm. And yeah. so she did that. She then, um, after her husband died, she became um, chairman of the governors of the National Theatre. And um, she really was the next best thing to the Queen, I think. She was very regal, very stately, a matriarch. And um, the Queen, as you can see in that bottom picture, um, made her a lady companion of the Order of the Garter, which is one of the highest orders of chivalry in the country, which um, was a massive um, honour. And actually, Mary, um, Mary's father, obviously Winston as well, um, was a member of the order. And they were the only non-royal father and daughter to get that oh, wow. ma massive accolade. And I, I love that picture of Mary because it really shows her um, as a real success, as a pillar of the establishment. She really was. 
um, someone who was very, very well respected and lived a very long and very, very happy life. And I think that must have been a great comfort to her parents through all this, that there was at least one of their children who did all right. Do you think um, that Winston or Clemmy were disappointed that they only had one son and that in, you know, he turned out to be not quite what they'd expected? I think it must have been a big disappointment um, to Winston because um, due to his awful relationship with his father, I mean, he loved his father, his father didn't love him. He really didn't want that in the next generation. And Winston and Randolph always loved each other, but they had a very, very difficult stormy relationship. Um, and I think Winston wanted this political dynasty but actually he couldn't get it with Randolph. Randolph just couldn't measure up to it. Mm. He was um, charismatic, he was good looking, he was eloquent when he was young, but he had some fatal flaws. Um, so Winston had to look elsewhere and he looked to his son-in-laws in a way. Um, Duncan Sands was very close to him when he first married Diana and they worked very closely together before the war. And then afterwards, Christopher Soames um, became Churchill's eyes and ears in his last premiership. And it's you know very doubtful that that premiership could have been in any way successful without um, Christopher Soames protecting him so much. Um, and particularly when Winston had the stroke, Christopher yeah. Soames and Churchill's private secretary, Jock Colville, um, kept it, him in power at that time because um, Winston was incapacitated, but no one knew. And um, Christopher and Jock Colville kept the government going, um, well, kept his premiership going at that time. Okay, so uh, another question, mm. uh, so many. <laughs> Do you think any of the girls would have made it as a politician in their own right had they been born you know, today or 20 years ago or something, if times were different? Arguably, I think they'd have made much better politicians than Randolph would, and for different reasons. And Diana was actually the most political. She loved political philosophy and ideas um, when she was really ill with her mental health problems. Um, Sarah said what she really needs is a philosophy, something to get her teeth into. And she just loved arguing, and she would think for herself politically. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that she lacked the ego um, to be able to push herself, particularly in an era when women weren't expected particularly to be in politics. So she really probably couldn't have done it in her own right, but she might have been good at it, um, as I say, because she had the ideas. Sarah would have had a lot going for her as a politician. Uh, she had the charisma, you know, she could perform, she could speak. And actually, when, when, uh, when Randolph fought by-elections at Wavertree in the 1930s, um, Sarah was the one who their nanny, Moppet, um, mm -hmm. said was the one who was really good with everyone. Again, that classlessness came through so she could motivate people to work for her and win people over, whereas Randolph would be really rude. But Sarah, um, although she had political ideas and obviously passed them on to her father, um, didn't want that ever. She wanted to perform on a very different stage. It was acting for her, more sort of artistic, creative thing. Thank you. Hmm, sorry, go on. I was going to say, Winston um, also enjoyed performing um, yeah. and he loved the cinema and, and all the rest of it. So yeah. they did. I mean, they did. I mean, it was very theatrical, all of it. There was this real theatrical streak running through. And um, I think at times the sort of um, banter between Winston and Sarah is almost like a music hall going because they were very funny together. Yeah. Um, but of the daughters, I think probably Mary was the one who, in a different age, might have been a politician. Um, she actually was the one who probably most seriously thought about it, because during the war, she did some speeches, sometimes to thousands of people. She broadcast in Canada to um, the Women's Army over there um, and did it very, very well. She was very eloquent. She was very confident. She was very good with people and good at managing people, as she showed when she mm -hmm. um, was in the army. Um, and at that stage, you know, as it came towards the end of the war, the press baron, um, Beaverbrook, who was a friend of Winston's, said, you know, you ought to get married to stand in the next general election. I mean, she'd have only been in her 20s. It would have been amazing. And 
Mary writes that for a moment she thought about it, she imagined herself standing up in Parliament with a beautiful black suit on and a super soft white, a big bow around her neck. And then she thought about what she'd been talking about, sort of drains and really boring yeah. things like that. And thought, mm, no, not for me. Um, and she actually really enjoyed being like her mother, being the support to Christopher Soames. And actually, um, when Christopher had a severe riding accident in 1964, he was incapacitated for the general election. He was in hospital. And so she had to fight the election campaign for him in the oh, Bedford goodness. constituency. And her daughter remembered her going at top speed down the streets, canvassing. But she did say that she actually found it was rather intrusive canvassing and going into people's houses. It wasn't, it wasn't exactly her. Again, she preferred being the support act. But she yes. certainly had the skills that would have made a very good and steady politician. Rachel, while, while you were um, answering my question, a, a little question popped up that I think um, is relevant to, to what you were just saying. Did the girls have the same political opinions as their father? Uh, did they ever fall out, fall out over politics? That's a really good question, really interesting. It's interesting that in the 1930s, um, their, their cousins were the Mitfords, we haven't really touched on that, but Clementine, through Clementine, um, the Mitford girls were cousins of the Churchills, and they'd all socialised a lot together in the 1920s. And in the 1930s, obviously, the Mitford girls went off in different directions, um, Jessica becoming a communist and notoriously um, Unity and Diana going with the fascists, um, whereas the Churchills all stayed unified politically. They believed Winston was right, totally. And um, they supported him. Um, the whole family turned out, um, Clementine was the way she didn't approve of it, when uh, Randolph stood um, as an independent conservative in these by-elections. Um, so they, they, didn't, they didn't disagree with their father's political views um, at all. The only time I found that there was a disagreement um, was in one letter which was written towards the end of the war and um, it was Clementine writing to say that Diana was toying with joining the Commonwealth Party which was a party set up by Dick Ackland and it um, was pretty socialist in its views um, mm -hmm. and believed in mor morality in politics and there's a lovely description of her talking about this over uh, dinner and her husband Duncan Sands nearly choking on his pheasant <laughs> as he heard her saying this um, and Clementine worrying do you think she's going to become a communist <laughs> but basically um, it's interesting they they supported Winston I wouldn't say they necessarily supported the conservatives because I don't think Clementine did necessarily um, Clementine people often said was really more of a liberal mm -hmm. and um, the girls you know did support what their father did. But again, it's a sign of how much they believed in him, that if he thought it was right, he probably was right. Yeah. And did, did, the, did the siblings get on? Did the girls get on? What was amazing was there's no bitching in the letters. Um, they, I think perhaps it worked really well because there was a big age gap between them and they were all so different. Um, uh, Sarah was five years younger than Diana and Mary was so much younger than them all. So Diana, uh, Sarah is the one who sort of links them all. She was very close to both sisters, particularly mm -hmm. at different times. Um, Diana and Sarah um, were very, very close. And so when um, Diana committed suicide, people were very worried about what would happen to Sarah because um, Sarah said Diana was the person who always believed the best in her. She always thought no matter what she'd done, she was all right, really. And she, mm -hmm knew that Diana would understand her. Um, Mary wasn't very close in a way to Diana because there was such a big age gap. By the time um, Mary was born, Diana had virtually left home. Um, so there wasn't a negative thing between them, but they weren't as close. And then Diana and, um, no, Sarah and Mary were very close um, at times. Sarah, when she was drinking, could be a nightmare, I think, for Mary to deal with. And after um, Diana had died, not Diana, Sarah had died, um, Jock Colville wrote to Mary saying, you were so patient, your father would be really proud of you. But I think Mary at times felt rather guilty that she had this perfect establishment life and things were so hard for Sarah. 
Yeah. Uh, but she wrote to Sarah saying, you know, you've been so good about it all. You know, she wasn't churlish about it. They did all really love each other. There was a real sisterly solidarity there. And I've had <laughs> some lovely quotes from them on that. And Randolph or not? Randolph is the uh, problem, as always. Um, he caused trouble always. I mean, he got on really badly with Clementine. Um, she always put Winston first, so she worried that Randolph would come in, get drunk, cause a storm, cause a major row and really upset him. Um, each of the girls had rather different relationships with Randolph. Diana was very close to him because they were very close to each other in age. Um, she was born in 1909, he was born in 1911. And when they were small, they were like this terrible twosome who terrorised their nannies, um, you know, would do awful sort of pranks and things like that. And then it's quite telling that when Randolph was at prep school and sexually abused, the one person he told was Diana. And it was through her that Winston heard and it was sorted out. Um, so they had a natural bond. Diana um, then, um, I suppose, got more distant from him when she married Duncan Sands because Duncan Sands was a political person too. But um, with Sarah, Sarah had an interesting relationship with Randolph. Um, Randolph was always sort of sent to sort things out when they went wrong for Sarah. Um, as when, she, her. <laughs> when, when, when she went to elope to America, he pursues her um, across the Atlantic. Then when she was arrested in America um, for drinking, he went out there. The trouble was when Randolph got involved, it usually made the situation worse. And he nearly ended up with a libel case when he went to America to try and defend her um, when she was done for drinking. Mm -hmm. um, but I think she was very, very fond of him. And when he died, she wrote a really touching letter to um, Randolph's daughter saying, another great oak tree has fallen, but we must carry on. So they had a close relationship. Um, Mary had a much more difficult relationship with Randolph. Um, again, with the age gap, she he had virtually left home when she was growing up, but it didn't get easier as they got older. Um, in the war, she felt very protective of her father and mother and really resented the way he came in and caused trouble. In fact, Clementine banned him from the house for a time because she thought he would give um, Winston a stroke by working him up so much. And um, Mary... Um, felt really angry with Randolph but Winston didn't approve of that he wanted the children to get on and told Mary to patch it up basically which upset her and mm -hmm. the relationship got worse when Mary married Christopher Soames because Christopher Soames became like the son um, Winston would have wanted yes. and that really hurt Randolph so you've got a very difficult dynamic going on there that um, Christopher Soames is in Parliament working very closely um, with his father, uh, with Winston all the time, and Randolph is excluded from this. And also, Christopher Soames introduces uh, Winston to horse racing, which was one of the great passions of his later years. Yeah. And Randolph resented this so much that he called um, Christopher the master of the horse in a very scathing way. Oh, yeah. And Rachel, again, just um, a question that popped up, and uh, I didn't. Oh. It's, it's quite a tricky question, actually, in that it's, um, it says, it's Susan Tackley, she said, how many descendants did the girls have and how many are still alive now? Right, well, I can do the children. Di um, Diana had three children, so Julian, Edwina and Celia. And mm -hmm. Julian's dead, but um, Celia and Edwina are still alive and Celia was lovely, she talked to me. Um, Edwina's in America. Um, then um, Mary had five children and they're all still alive and doing all sorts of things now. I mean, obviously there's Nicholas Soames, um, who was a Tory MP, um, Jeremy Soames, who's the head of Serco, who has been doing test and trace and things, I think. <laughs> so um, there's, that, there's Emma Soames, who is bringing out the diaries of her mother. And um, I think that, yes, there are two more. So all her children are alive. Um, but um, Randolph, um, Randolph's children are dead. And they're not, it's strange because some of the family are so incredibly long lived. I mean, Clementine and Winston um, were so elderly, you know, 90 and 92 or three when they died. Um, but so many of the children died young. Mm -hmm. 
And, and Sarah, of course, didn't have any, did she? Yeah, Sarah didn't ever have no. children. No. Gosh. Okay, well, I think, you know, this has been an absolute joy. You know, you can just see how passionate you are about the girls. So I'm going to ask you a real stinker of a question. <laughs> so who's your favourite? It has to be. <laughs> um, I just found her so lively, so... Uh, sorry, sorry, Rachel, I, I laughed over your answer and I didn't get to it. <laughs> so sorry. Um, who was your favourite? Who is Sarah. your favourite? Sarah. Okay, yeah. excellent. Yeah, because she just was so, so really uh, vivid and lively and talented. And it's just so tragic that she didn't quite get to fulfil that potential. There's so much tragedy there and you can really identify with that, that she was such a human and you make a person as well. And of course, she set you on this path. She did. Sarah started it and she's never let me down. Uh, excellent. Well, I have to say, and, and we've, we've had some lovely comments saying thank you and how much they, people have enjoyed it. And uh, Debbie has said, can you remind me of the name of the book? So here you are. Good, good. Thank you. <laughs> it's the Churchill Girls and you can get it at all good bookshops and it's on sale in the Blenheim gift shop. So um, I think it's, it's a fantastic read. It really is. And Rachel, I have to say thank you so much for giving us your time this evening. And it's been an absolute joy. Thank you. Thank you. You've been fantastic to work with. Throughout. Yeah. Thank you. Not at all. And I look forward to welcoming you to Blenheim when you're able to travel. Oh, that would be lovely. <laughs> that would be such a treat. <laughs> okay. Thanks ever so much a lot. And no. good night, everyone. And oh, hold on, there's one more question. Oh, sorry. sorry. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> right, Nancy Coke, if you wouldn't mind emailing me, I'll send you the link to the recording. Um, and it's you've missed a very good talk, so I'm sure you'll you'll enjoy it. Okay. You. Um, you're very welcome, Nancy. So good night and thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.